Hello and welcome to the Jim Ruff Show. Today we have a special guest, David Whitfield, who has driven up from Olympia. And David is a college professor and a speaker and a coach. And uh, David teaches courses in leadership and in social justice through Gonzaga University. And David uses my textbook, or my book, uh, in a couple of those courses, uh, Society's Breakthrough. But David and I are going to talk today about racism. And last night, David was here uh, early, and we got a chance to hear a little bit of his story. So I'm going to introduce David, and then he is going to tell you a little bit about his story uh, of how he has come to such a passion about the racism. And then he's going to kind of be the guest host a little bit and ask me some questions about how society's breakthrough, to kind of flesh out a little bit how society's breakthrough would address the issue of racism. So David, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So you were going to, you told a wonderful story last night, and I want you to uh, share a little bit about it. And one of the th things that you shared was that you walked away from a plantation at age 13, not knowing how to read, and you walked away, and you were alone in the world, and never went back to your parents, to the plantation, to nothing. And so maybe you could start there and tell us a little bit about what prompted that and how, you, how that worked for you. Okay, so wow, I um, grew up on a plantation in Mississippi, a uh, very, uh, very strange state. But what prompted me to leave Mississippi was that I didn't like the way, I didn't like what I saw, I didn't like the way people were being treated. And what really got me to thinking about racism differently was when we went to a farmer's house. My, one of my brothers and I um, had to get some corn ground for bread. And it had been three days since we had food. We walked, I'm told it was about eight miles one way, carrying this corn in a sack to grind it. So we get to the farmer's house, we knocked on the door, went to the back, as law required, Mississippi state law, and the wife came to the door and let us in after we had knocked on the door, stepped back, head down. And she saw that we were hungry, and she said um, in our Mississippi drawl that we looked hungry. And I looked at Frank, and Frank looked at me, and she says, come on in, y'all come on in. And hurry up, because my husband's out hunting, and if he finds out, he'll be really angry. And so I'll make a long story short, she invited us into her kitchen, which was against the law, fed us breakfast, a humongous breakfast, pancakes and potatoes, fried potatoes and peppers and onions, and I can never forget the uh, tablecloth that was red, white, checkered. Never forget that. She kept saying, you know, hurry up, you know, but don't eat too fast or my husband may be back. This woman took risk. She risked her marriage. More importantly, she risked her life for letting two black boys sit at her kitchen table to eat. So it got me thinking differently about everything I had been taught up to that point was just uh, blown out of the water. I started thinking differently about race and racism because uh, this woman, a white farmer's wife, took us in and fed us. And I, and I just thought that was awesome. So um, about three years after that, I, I, I walked away. Um, with a dime, a nickel, and a penny in my pocket, and I have not been back there since. And I didn't see my parents until 13 years later, so. Wow. And that was the beginning of a journey that took you to learn how to read, that took you now, you know, three languages. Yes. You spent 23 years in Europe. Yes. As a consultant. Yes. You're now a speaker, and uh, you teach these courses in Social justice, mm -hmm. statistics, and statistics, leadership theory, and leadership theory, and um, but um, I, I want to get back to the story just briefly, and then I'll transition into some questions. Um, I started thinking, I started seeing the world differently after this uh, incident. Um, it changed my thinking about the world in general and people in particular. And I am one.
realm of racism. I mean, for you in terms of recognizing racism and recognize, changing your thinking about, about how race works and, and so forth. To me, that's, there's two things here. One is talking about racism and the other is the transformational experience of an interaction with people mm -hmm. that somehow where you get it, where people get it, that hey, we're just people here. This isn't, uh, and that, so I'm, I'm interested in Establishing a national conversation that is a quality above is of a certain quality where people just get it that we need one another and that we're just people here and when we've got some big problems and we need to solve them and one of those problems is racism. Mm -hmm. So in terms of just working on issues, if we could if there was a way to have this kind of conversation where all of us became a we and we set new policy in this country, not, I mean, the way it happens now is some elected officials set policy and then you and I say we did it, or this is we attacked Iraq, mm -hmm. or it's, it's a little silly that w we would think it's a we <laughs> when we weren't a part of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet we sort of were a part of it because we participated in an election ceremony where the incumbents get reelected, basically. So, we say we did that, but there was no we about it. The key is to have a conversation where all of us are apart and there really is this sense of we are deciding something here. We are choosing a direction. Mm -hmm. And if, if we go through that process, that, that to me is a, is a healing process where we're all, depending on the caliber of the conversation, that the process of that conversation itself heals racism, plus part of what our topic will be will be racism. Okay, so so how does weocracy differ from democracy, and then how would it? What would be some of the processes and and going toward transcending this very divisive uh, uh, construct? Yeah. So democracy is the the idea is that demos means the common people, mm -hmm. and the. The common people are in power. Mm -hmm. That crassy means power. So the demos, crassy, the common people are in power. Okay. So what w our representation of that right now is that we get to elect these people who are really in power. Mm -hmm. Really, it's sort of a new elite. Mm -hmm. And the elite is really in power. So we don't really have a democracy. We have a republic. And that's what what the ideal of the founders was, is to have a republic. But, if there, but there was a moment in time, 200 years ago, I think, where there sort of was a we the people mm -hmm. that set up the new system, said, hey, let's all, we didn't include blacks, we didn't include Native Americans, we didn't include women, we didn't include non-property holders, but there was a we at the time of this, that was revolutionary that that said, let's try this new system and let's add a Bill of Rights. And it was sort of near unanimous at that point to go ahead with this, this system. That was the last time there was a we. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ever since, from then on, the system was on automatic pilot and there was no we in charge. There was no we the people setting the direction. Okay. Okay. What we need, I think, what the, the we that we need is we need a process, the same kind of conversation that happened way back then, where we, the people, now set direction in all kinds of ways, set a, a shared vision. Mm -hmm. And the way that happens, the way there could be a we doing that, is a certain kind of conversation. I'm jumping ahead, is that, that if you and I, if, if all of us were to somehow have a, a breakthrough where everybody was somehow gathered and we would have a breakthrough, then I, look, I am celebrating your difference. Oh, I, we couldn't have achieved that breakthrough without you being different than me, having a different opinion. Okay, okay. 
being a different person. So that the, the, the process of thinking that allows a breakthrough to happen is the, is the kind of quality of thinking we need to have if okay. we're going to have this we. Okay, so how, in, in invoking we accuracy, how, what processes, how do we go toward that breakthrough? How, how do we head in that direction? Okay. Well, of course, the, the way, what, I'm, what needs to happen, I think, is that if you randomly select, mm -hmm. say, 10 to 12 people okay. from the nation, mm -hmm. and those people, we're going to give you three factors. If you randomly select these people, mm -hmm. if they choose the issue, and if they reach unanimity on that issue, mm -hmm. If they're unanimous and they all stand, yes, this is what we all think, then, you, then we've achieved a symbol of we the people of the United States. Okay. That's like the inception of the process. Yeah, that's, that's the beginning of the process. So if, if, if somehow, no matter who sets it up, just you or I or whatever, if we get the, and we meet those three criteria, mm -hmm. that if they're random, they select the issue, and if, if they uh, reach unanimity, that then their voice is a voice of we the people. It's the first general interest voice that I'm aware of in 220 years. Everything else has just been a special interest voice. Mm -hmm. so, so once they get to this point, what, how do they proceed? Um, walk us through a bit, of, if possible, the process of heading toward, going toward a breakthrough in transcending racism. Well, so... So if you were to get a random selected group, mm -hmm. presumably you'd have people of different races and different backgrounds, different opinions. You'd mm -hmm. have conservatives, liberals. And you're going to do this on a regular basis. So you're going to get, over time, the same percentage of blacks in the society are going to be in this group, or the same percentage of, of heterosexuals will be in the society and be in this group. So we're going to get a, a real motley group. And then... Uh, they, in order to achieve unanimity, they need to be in a creative conversation where they have breakthroughs and shifts. I call it a choice-creating conversation instead of a decision-making conversation. In other words, if they're just going to do Robert's Rules of Order and somebody make a motion and then they're going to vote and then they come up with a majority, they're not going to have any breakthroughs and they're just going to have a, an argument and then they're going to have a majority rule kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That is a deadly conversation. We were laughing about it. That's what boards do. But so if you, if you have this other kind of conversation where you're f f dynamically facilitated mm -hmm. and they have, and people say, well, what are the issues we should talk about? And, and people talk about, m you might ring up the issue of racism and people might talk about racism or they might talk about um, the environment or they might talk about health care. Mm -hmm. The fact that or people might talk about economic injustice, the fact that they can't afford to pay their bills, or mm -hmm. whatever issue they choose, they will have breakthroughs and shifts and come up with a unanimous perspective that, e that they feel proud of. Okay, so what would a breakthrough look like in this context? We're, we're, we got this group together, yeah. we got um, everybody's unanimous, everybody's in agreement, and, and we're going to go toward transcending racism. What would a breakthrough look like? Well, so, there are different kinds of breakthroughs, but one, one kind of breakthrough is the kind that happened to you okay. in, sitting at the, this farmer woman's table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was a shift in your heart where you got it, somehow got it. And maybe that moment, maybe it was afterwards, somehow something happened where you shifted and you were not going to be the same from now on. Mm -hmm, okay. Now, it wasn't a new concept, mm -hmm. but it was a shift in your heart. Yeah. And now you are an empowered person. You said, okay, I'm not going to have this particular life that's laid out for me. I'm not going to live this life. Thank you very much. I'm going to try for something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that shift is the same kind of shift that could happen. It could be a breakthrough of, of the heart where people get it that, hey, we're the, all the same. Race doesn't matter. We're all the same. And, mm -hmm. and what we need is to, to put something on the ground that supports everybody. And mm -hmm. so... Uh, and, and where there's a new awareness of, of the limits that we've been putting on people. Um, I don't know what, how it would take, but, but one kind of breakthrough is a shift of the heart. Another kind of breakthrough is, hey, if we do this particular piece of legislation, it would change all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, this farmer's wife, 
it was against the law. She broke the law, Mississippi law, what she did. She yeah. violated the law, which and violated a lot of other cultural norms and, and belief systems, and that's why it was dangerous for her to do what she did. And and, and later on, I, I've been processing this event in my head ever since that happened. I was like 10 years old. Um, so if we, we start this process, how do we get critical mass? How do we get, um, how do we how do we go toward critical mass that, that people get it and there's less divisiveness within the nation? Yes. You know, that, that's a big Absolutely. order. I don't know if Absolutely. It's a order, but. Absolutely. So there's a small group conversation and those people have shifts and breakthroughs. And we've done this, of course, in mm -hmm. different, we've done these random selections of people and, mm -hmm. and they have shifts and breakthroughs and they're pumped. And they then walk on stage and they, now the key is how do we get that experience to resonate to everybody? How does everybody feel a part of that conversation mm -hmm. and that present? Mm -hmm. When they walk on stage and present to an assembled gathering of the townspeople, say, mm -hmm. so in the nation, national case, they would present presumably on TV to a large audience of maybe celebrities and everybody would hear the presentation and then they would meet in small groups and talk about it. When we've done this in the past, pretty much everybody in the audience says, yeah, we think so too. Mm -hmm. And they engage in a conversation that's similar, not the same, but similar to what that other group did. In other words, they're talking from the heart. They're also thinking more in terms of these breakthroughs and shifts and kind of being a part of that similar conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, is how do we get this randomly selected group to be on center stage where all of us identify and with them as we the people, a symbolic voice of we the people, and then you and I get to talk and be a part of that conversation. And then we would maybe send uh, our views into the internet or different, um, we would have a, na a national conversation. And then in four months, we'd randomly select a new group different group. And they would also be random. They would also choose the issue mm -hmm. and they would also reach unanimity. And what we found is that the issues that they choose, if there's, if they're not just, if there's, if they're connected to the audience, they tend to take the issue as a next step. They tend to take the conversation the next step, this, the second random group. Mm -hmm. And would this follow something similar to a strategic plan? I mean, we have this vision of a national conversation. Then we have a mission of pursuing this and just on down the old strategic planning process. Would, would it be similar to that? Or would that, would that necessarily work, do you think? Well, no, I, I see it as a different kind of conversation. But okay. the, you would randomly select this group, and they would just talk. Mm -hmm. But they're being facilitated, dynamically facilitated, so they're not going down a path that's been preordained. Okay. They're just okay. talking. Okay. And, and they're talking from the heart, and they're talking about what really matters. And the, with dynamic facilitation, they're noticing that, oh, hey, we're making headway here. There's a story here of progress that's happening. And that's what's cool about dynamic facilitation is that you don't train anybody, you don't have, impose a process. People just are visiting together and the facilitator protects everybody. Mm -hmm. So when you speak from the heart about something that's important to you, you're protected. It, you don't feel that sense of judgment. Uh, if somebody says, oh, that's a bad idea or somebody cuts you off in what you're saying, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. there, there's just this visiting together and moving forward and then stopping and noticing, hey, we've reached, we've reached unanimity on lots of stuff here. Let's just gather that together. Mm -hmm. We, we call that a co-sensing. So it's like an evolution, it evolves. Yes, gradually. so it's not, it's not here now, we're doing the plan. But what you end up with is a vision, a shared vision that we all have. Oh. And you end up with maybe a mission and you end up with a strategy of how, how we might proceed. And you, a, a, it's a strategy of, hey, here's legislation we can do, here's individual actions we can do, here's um, individual actions I'm going to do, mm -hmm. the individuals in the group will say. Uh, so it's an inspiring process. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like strategic planning in the reverse. It is. It is. Hmm. Yeah. The, the, the strategic plan is here's the, what we're going to do, here's the plan we need to come up with, here's the whatever. Mm -hmm. This is just visiting and noticing that we came up with this, a mission and a vision and a strategic plan. I, okay. So as of now, what, do you, what would you like people to know about 
this process, um, be it wackeracy or you use the term wackeracy, use the term wisdom council, right? Yes. So, what would you want people to know now? That's a great question. If you were talking to everyone right now, what would you want them to hear you say about this? Okay, we have some a convergence of crises in our society mm -hmm. that cannot be solved within the existing system. Okay. Okay. We can pass laws, we can whatever, everybody can become conscious, we can reach critical mass of consciousness. It's not going to matter unless we deal with the system. Mm -hmm. This is a way to change the system. Here is a way to create a we the people, a visit of all of us, mm -hmm. that can set the direction for the system that we have. It has no risk. Lots of individual risk, because it's asking us to change. But in terms of our system, this is a random selection of people. They're randomly selected. They make a statement. They go away. Here is a low, no-risk strategy for transforming our system to become workable, where there's a we the people in charge, weocracy instead of what we currently call democracy. It's really true democracy. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have all these crises. We don't really have a way to solve them within the system. We have lots of answers that are ready to go that we can put, plug in. We know how to stop global warming. We know how to stop uh, poverty. We know how to stop racism. The problem is, is that our system is preventing us from doing this, is from stopping this. Here, the system that we need to move to is a system where we, the people, are involved and in charge of our own lives, that it isn't somebody else, especially somebody 200 years ago, that's setting the direction for us mm -hmm. today. So, and here is a workable way to put in place a strategy for changing that system. And the best way to get this thing in place, if you were to, if you were to ask me, would be to pass it as a constitutional amendment but we don't need to, because then everybody would pay attention. And this randomly selected group, we'd all be there, because we'd know it was us. But if it wasn't passed as a constitutional amendment, we can just start doing it anyway. So the, the amendment would be a post hoc to, because if you pass the amendment, there, there's no guarantee that you'll have these internal shifts or these breakthroughs, or? Well, the, what, there is, <laughs> There's no guarantee, but you would. <laughs> I mean, in other words, if you enter into a creative space, mm -hmm. shifts happen. People, people become different. Mm -hmm. okay. And what, what, the way this, if you think about what a facilitator is, a facilitator is one person, you, who goes into a room of people and shifts the way those people think. Now they're possibly thinking at a very, very high level. Now, if you're going as a facilitator and teach them about Robert's Rules of Order, that's, very, that's a very low level of thinking. Mm. But if you facilitate in a way where, that raises this quality of thinking, where now they're thinking at this heartfelt, creative way that I call choice creating, where we're looking at what really matters, and we're trying to figure out what's best for everybody, and we're coming up with unanimous answers that we're excited about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you could... So there's a system. You have shifted the system of thinking in that room. It's possible also to shift the system of thinking in our whole society. Because right now we have a system of thinking in our society that's very low level. And in fact, we get a war every 40 years or so, and we, get a, uh, we have these voting, and we have all these people angry that are 49% that feel mm -hmm. slighted, and, and we have this distribution of wealth where the... the ultra wealthy actually control the system. That's our system. How do we shift to a system where we're all just kind of put aside that and we become together and we try and figure out what's best for everybody mm -hmm. and we, we are wise with our resources and we work with the planet? Okay, people might think that's utopia. Why even think about that? But I'm saying, hey, here's a str rational strategy for getting there. We can get there. And, and, it's, and uh, it's not that hard. <laughs> so the difficulty is, because it's so far out of the box, it's hard to be heard right now. I'm, uh, I'm still feeling a little invisible. But, but OK, so it occurs to me that perhaps we should approach people by trying to change, informing them that 
what's going on now, or agree to what's going on now is not working very effectively. And we do have a choice. We do have a, um, a way of creating different choices because right now, this is, and there's a lot of variation right now in, among us in thinking. I would think we'd want to have more heterogeneity or homogeneity in thinking or less variation among people in thinking. Right now we're kind of all over the map, I believe, as a nation. Well, the, 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 there's two ways to think <laughs> in, in terms of reaching unanimity. Mm -hmm. One is to all be the, think the same. Mm -hmm and you eliminate all that, or somehow get people to mute when they feel differences, to just kind of mute that and join the group. Mm -hmm. The other way is to have a breakthrough, where you, mm -hmm. you are different than me and we keep our differences, but we have a breakthrough where you're, what we've discovered is better than what you thought was possible and better than what I thought was possible, but we're now thinking the same thing, but we're, our differences are even greater than they were before because now we're uh, maybe not greater, but, but we're celebrating our distinctness. Mm -hmm. That's, that second quality of thinking is the cure to racism. Okay. Because now we can accept the differences and yet reach this joint place. Mm -hmm. That's what I call choice creating. Okay. And that's what this process of, of thinking can engender. This, this wisdom council process can engender. So I'm getting the signal we need to stop. Okay. <laughs> But let me, uh, let me just thank you. I want to be sure and thank you, David. David, this is David Whitfield, who is a certified genius, I swear, and has gone through an amazing story. And I thank you very much for not only coming here to be a part of this show, but also in your teaching processes and taking your story to the world. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Good. Thanks.